silentness. Be still, the crown of life is silentness. Give thou a quiet hour to each long day. Too much of time we spend in profitless and foolish talk. Too little do we say. If thou wouldst gather words that shall avail, learning a wisdom worthy to express, leave for a while thy chat and empty tale. Study the golden speech of silentness. A. L. Salmon Be still, my soul. Rest a while from the feverish activities in which you lose yourself. Be not afraid to be left alone with yourself for one short hour. Ernest Crossley In the words of a wise man there is great power, but his silence is more powerful still. The greatest men teach us most effectively when they are purposely silent. The silent attitude of the great man noted, perhaps, by one or two of his disciples, only is recorded and preserved through the ages, while the obtrusive words of the merely clever talker, heard perhaps by thousands, and at once popularized, are neglected and forgotten in, at most, a few generations. The silence of Jesus, when asked by Pilate, what is truth, is the impressive, the awful silence of profound wisdom. It is pregnant with humility and reproof, and perpetually rebukes that shallowness that, illustrating the truth, that fools step in where angels fear to tread, would in terms of triteness parcel out the universe, or think to utter the be-all and the end-all of the mystery of things in some textual formula or theological platitude. When plied with questions about Brahma, God, by the argumentative Brahmins, Buddha remained silent. He taught them better than they knew, and if by his silence he failed to satisfy the foolish, he thereby profoundly instructed the wise. Why all this ceaseless talk about God with its accompaniment of intolerance? Let men practice some measure of kindliness and goodwill, and thereby acquaint themselves with the simple rudiments of wisdom. Why all this speculative argument about the nature of God? Let us first understand somewhat of ourselves. There is no greater mark of folly and moral immaturity than a reverence in presumption, no greater manifestations of wisdom and moral maturity than reverence and humility. Lao Tzu, in his own life, exemplified his teaching that the wise man teaches without words. Disciples were attracted to him by the power which ever accompanies a wise reserve. Living in comparatively obscurity and silence, not courting the ear of men, and never going out to teach, men sought him out and learned of his wisdom. The silent acts of the great ones are beacons to the wise, illuminating their pathway with no uncertain radiance, for he who would attain to virtue and wisdom must learn, not only when to speak and what to say, but also when to remain silent and what not to say. The right control of the tongue is the beginning of wisdom. The right control of the mind is the consummation of wisdom. By curbing his tongue, a man gains possession of his mind, and to have complete possession of one's mind is to be the master of silence. The fool babbles, gossips, argues, and bandies words. He glories in the fact that he has had the last word and has silenced his opponent. He exults in his own folly, is ever on the defensive, and wastes his energies in unprofitable channels. He is like a gardener who continues to dig and plant in unproductive soil. The wise man avoids idle words, gossip, vain argument, and self-defense. He is content to appear defeated, rejoices when he is defeated, knowing that, having found and removed another error in himself, he has thereby become wiser. Blessed is he who does not strive for the last word. Backward I see in my own days where I sweated through fog with linguists and contenders. I have no mockings or arguments. I witness and wait. Silence under provocation is the mark of a cultured and sympathetic soul. The thoughtless and unkind are stirred by every slight provocation and will lose their mental balance by even the appearance of a personal encroachment. The self-possession of Jesus is not a miracle. It is the flower of culture, 
the diadem of wisdom. When we read of Jesus, that he answered never a word, and of Buddha, that he remained silent, we get a glimpse of the vast power of silence, of the silent majesty of true greatness. The silent man is the powerful man. Every mechanic knows that before a force can be utilized and definitely directed, it must be conserved and stored, and the wise man is a spiritual mechanic who conserves the energies of his mind, holds them in masterful abeyance, ready at any moment to direct them, with effective purpose, to the accomplishment of some necessary work. The true strength is in silentness. It is well said that the dog that barks does not bite. The grim and rarely broken silence of the bulldog is the necessary adjunct to that powerfully concentrated and effectual action for which the animal is known and feared. This, of course, is a lower form of silentness, but the principle is the same. The boaster fails, his mind is diverted from the main purpose, and his energies are frittered away upon self-glorification. His forces are divided between his task and the reward to himself, the greater portion going to feed the lust of the reward. He is like an unskillful general who loses the battle through dividing his forces instead of concentrating them upon a point, or he is like a careless engineer who leaves open the waste valve of his engine and allows the steam to run down. The modest, silent, earnest man succeeds, freed from vanity and avoiding the dissipation of self-glorification. All his powers are concentrated upon the successful performance of his task. Even while the other man is talking about his powers, he is already about his work, and so much nearer than the other to its completion. It is a law everywhere and always that energy distributed is subject unto energy conserved. The noisy and boasting Charles will ever be thrown by the quiet and modest Orlando. It is a law universally applicable that quietness is strength. The businessman who succeeds never talks about his plans, methods, and affairs, and should he, turn giddy by success, begin to do this, he will then commence to fail. The man of great moral influence never talks about himself and his spiritual victories, for should he do so, in that moment, his moral power and influence would be gone, and like Samson, he would be shorn of his strength. Success, worldly or spiritual, is the willing servant of strong, steady, silent, unflinching purpose. The most powerful disintegrating forces make no noise. The greatly overcoming mind works silently. If you would be strong, useful, and self-reliant, learn the value and power of silentness. Do not talk about yourself. The world instinctively knows that the vain talker is weak and empty, and so it leaves him to his own vanity. Do not talk about what you are going to do, but do it, and let your finished work speak for itself. Do not waste your forces in criticizing and disparaging the work of others, but set about to do your own work thoroughly and well. The worst work with earnestness and sweetness behind it is altogether better than barking at others. While you are disparaging the work of others, you are neglecting your own. If others are doing badly, help and instruct them by doing better yourself. Neither abuse others nor account their abuse of any weight. When attacked, remain silent. In this way you will conquer yourself, and will, without the use of words, teach others. But the true silence is not merely a silent tongue, it is a silent mind. To merely hold one's tongue, and yet to carry about a disturbed and rankling mind, is no remedy for weakness and no source of power. Silentness, to be powerful, must envelop the whole mind, must permeate every chamber of the heart. It must be the silence of peace. To this broad, deep, abiding silentness, a man attains only in the measure that he conquers himself. While passions, temptations, and sorrows disturb, the holier, profounder depths of silence are yet to be sounded. To smart under the words and actions of others means that you are yet weak, uncontrolled, and unpurified. So rid your heart of the disturbing influences of vanity and pride and selfishness 
that no petty spite can reach you, no slander or abuse disturb your serene repose. As the storm wages ineffectually against a well-built house, while its occupant sits composed and happy by his fireside within, so no evil can disturb or harm him who is well fortified with wisdom, self-governed and silent, he remains at peace within. To this great silence the self-conquered man attains. Envy and calumny, and hate and pain, and that unrest which men miscall delight, can touch him not, nor torture him again. There is no commoner error amongst men than that of supposing that nothing can be accomplished without much talking and much noise. The busy, shallow talker regards the quiet thinker or silent doer as a man wasted. He thinks silentness means doing nothing, and that hurrying, bustling, and ceaseless talking means doing much. He also confounds popularity with power. But the thinker and doer is the real effectual worker. His work is at the root and core and substance of things, and his nature silently, yet with hidden and wondrous alchemy, transmutes the rude elements of earth and air into tender leaves, beautiful flowers, delectable fruits, yes, into a myriad form of beauty. Even so does the silent, purposeful worker transform the ways of men and the face of the world by the might and magic of his silently directed energy. He wastes no time and force in tinkering with the ever-changing and artificial surface of things, but goes to the living vital center and works therefrom and thereon, and in due season, perhaps when his perishable form is withdrawn from the world, the fruits of his obscure but imperishable labors come forth to gladden the world. But the words of the talker perish. The world reaps no harvest from the sowing of sound. He who conserves his mental forces also conserves his physical forces. The strongly quiet, calm man lives to a greater age and in possession of better health than the hurrying, noisy man. Quiet, subdued mental harmony is conducive to physical harmony and health. The followers of George Fox are today the healthiest, longest-lived, and most successful portion of the British community, and they live quiet, unostentatious, purposeful lives, avoiding all worldly excitements and unnecessary words. They are silent people all their meetings being conducted on the principle that silence is power. Silentness is powerful because it is the outcome of self-conquest, and the more successfully a man governs himself, the more silent he becomes. As he succeeds in living to a purpose and not to the pleasure of self, he withdraws himself from the outer discords of the world and reaches to the inward music of peace. And when he speaks, there is purpose and power behind his words, and when he maintains silence, there is an equal or even greater power therein. He does not utter that which is followed by pain and tears, does not do that which is productive of sorrow and remorse, but saying and doing those things only which are ripe with thoughtfulness, his conscience is quiet, and all his days are blessed.